Test one, two, one, two. One, two, one, two. Test one, two, three. One, two, three. Excellent.
Good evening. Welcome to the November 4th, 2020 public hearing for the City of Tampa's Architecture Review Commission. Welcome everyone. My name is Zachary Greco, Chair of the Commission. If you are here to present a project, you will have limited time to make your presentation. So we suggest being thorough but concise. When coming to the microphone, you will need to identify yourself and your relationship to the project. Commissioners will not ask any questions during your presentation. Your project should be presented in the following order. Site plan, elevations, architectural details, and wall sections. Staff will then present the staff report. We will then ask for public comment. Following your presentation, the commissioners will be asking questions in the same order as the presentation. Please state and spell your name clearly if you are here to speak for or against a project. Your time will be limited to three minutes, so take some time now to summarize your comments because three minutes go by very quickly. Following public comment, the applicant will be allowed five minutes for rebuttal. The public hearing will then be closed. <coughs> the only comments which will be allowed after the public hearing is closed will be in response to any questions from the commissioners. The commissioners will then ask, I'm sorry, the commissioners will then discuss the case and will make their decision based on the city ordinance chapter 27 of the city zoning code, the design guidelines, the secretary of the interior standards, the historic preservation development review comments, HPDRC, and the testimony given at this public hearing. The ARC can only act on items that are within our specific jurisdictional responsibility. Owners and agents are independently responsible to obtain any appropriate permits and or approvals. If you haven't done so already, please silence all cell phones. At this point, I'm gonna ask my fellow commissioners starting on my right to introduce themselves. Ashley DeCubis, I'm an attorney. Susan Klaus Smith, architect. Steven Sutton, architect. We're also joined tonight by staff um, Dennis Fernandez, Ron Vila, Beverly Jewisak, and Kamaria pettis Mackel with legal. Oh, sorry. Um, hello, Kamaria pettis Mackel from the city attorney's office. Will the um, commissioners please state whether or not they have any conflicts of interest regarding any of the items that are located on the agenda? None. None. No, none. none. <clears throat> Thank you. Additionally, will the commissioners please state on the record whether or not they've had any ex parte communication regarding any of the items that are on the agenda? None. None. No. None. Thank you. Good evening, commissioners. My name is Ron Vila. I'm staff with Historic Preservation. Under continuations, we have one uh, addressed this evening, which is ARC 20 446 for the address of 1801 uh, Richardson. That request came in. Uh, by the agent to continue to the December 7th, 2020 public hearing at 6 p.m. And if we could get a motion, please. Make a motion to uh, continue, to grant a continuance in case ARC 20-446 for the property located at, I'm sorry, 1801 Richardson to the, pub, to the December 7th public hearing at 6 p.m. I second that motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion passes. At this time, we're going to do the swear-in. Everybody that wishes to testify, please stand up and raise your right hand, including staff. Ms. Juzak will swear us in. I do. Moving to the first two cases uh, this evening, they are um, woven together for simplicity uh, I spoke with the agent and they are going to do a complete presentation at once once their presentation is complete then we'll veer off to the relocation first and then the PD second so the two that are going to be opened up together are ARC 20-447 that's for the address of 815 South Rome Avenue uh, the request is for a relocation, so the structure is going from 815 South Rome to 910 South Fremont, and I have some photos to share with you so you get an understanding of uh, the proximity of where it's going to move to. The structure that's being moved is a contributing structure. It dates back to 1912, and as they do their presentation, you could follow along with a criteria that must be met uh, in their presentation. On page three of your staff report, that's chapter 27, 116, F, one and two, which addresses the relocation. And then secondly, uh, the second case is ARC 20, 
20-401 slash REZ, because this is a rezoning, 20-80. And once the relocation, if it's approved this evening from 815 South Rome, obviously that parcel will be uh, vacant and they're going to request a recommendation from this board to rezone it from RS50 to PD. And also when they do their presentation on page three, there is a section of chapter 27, 113, the duties and powers of this board. And it's underlined there uh, what your charge is this evening. And I'll go through that at, uh, again later. Moving to the photos. I'd like to start with the Sanborn map. <clears throat> This shows the density in the fabric back from 1929. Excuse me. Um, north is up. Uh, the property uh, in question is 815 South Rome Avenue. It's highlighted in the green box. This is Rome here in Bristol. So the house that's going to be relocated sits on the corner. And it's going to be relocated to the red area over here. Currently, there is a non-contributing um, stru uh, primary structure there that uh, will receive approval for demolition administratively. That's a function that we could do. And then if it's approved, uh, and you'll see the route that the structure is gonna take. This is the vicinity map. I know it's kind of small, but this, just so you get your bearings as a reference point, you have Hyde Park Village here. The, sh the structure currently sits at the end of Hyde Park Village, and it's gonna be re relocated more into a, a um, residential setting. This is an overhead of that same area. Once again, you have snow that dies into Rome, Rome and Bristol, corner property, and then you have Fremont over here. This is Bristol and then Fremont. Looking at the structure that's gonna be relocated, this is the uh, front elevation, which faces a Rome. Kind of looking at, at the site more in a holistic approach. You see some of the trees that are here. You see they have a little knee wall that surrounds the property. Uh, structures can be relocated and then uh, a parking area. Looking down the access from Rome And then continuing to the south, parcels, the, the uh, structures here, drive aisle, and then uh, additional parcel. This is looking at the side elevation, which is the south. This is kind of showing it at a distance again to show the retaining wall here, show some of the trees. This is just looking at the structure a little closer. Moving around to the rear, I don't believe this portion, this was an addition, and I don't believe this is gonna make the move. This is uh, apartments, or excuse me, condos, just to the north of the subject site. Across Bristol to the south is Kate Jackson Park. God bless you. Thank you. Directly across the street, you have, um, Hyde Park Village, you see the massing that's here and a parking garage. Um, subject site here, parking garage across the street. This is looking back into the village, down snow. This is looking at, from Bristol. Subject site is over here, Kate Jackson Park, Bristol and Hyde Park Village. Turning around Bristol, looking back into the neighborhood. Subject site is here, Kate Jackson Park. Bristol heading towards the Crosstown. There is an alley that runs north and south behind the site. This is looking from the alley back into the, the uh, property and you see the rear of the contributing structure.
to get your bearings again. This is the structure that's going to be relocated. It's going to Fremont. This is 910 Fremont. Now we're going to this site. This is the non-contributing structure that currently um, rests there that will be removed. Behind this non-contributing structure is a contributing accessory structure. That's the front of it. This is the rear off the alley. Some of the surrounding properties at the receiving site, you see a two-story volume here. This is the receiving site here. This is to the north, to the south of the receiving site. You have a one-story structure. Directly across the street, you have another craftsman-style home, and then you have a two-story Mediterranean right across the street as well. And just to conclude, uh, you see the trees here. Uh, Mr. Federico is going to show you the route that it's going to take. And um, that concludes the photo presentation. A lot of moving parts to this project. If you need to revisit the photos, I'll have them handy. Thank you. At this time, um, Mr. Gardner, do you want to address the board? It doesn't matter. Okay, thank you. Good evening, Tru Truett Gardner for 400 North Ashley Drive. And I'm here on behalf of WT Real Estate Holdings LLC, which is an entity managed by John Touchton. And as Dennis mentioned from a procedural standpoint, what we'd like to do and what we think would make more sense for you as well is to present both of these matters knowing that when it comes time to vote, they'll need to be taken up and addressed separately. So if that makes sense from you, I think just from the flow and an efficiency standpoint, that would be absolutely fine with us. And what we're presenting tonight, we hope you will view as a great project that makes logical sense for Hyde Park and will produce a great outcome for Hyde Park as well. We have a great team that we've assembled. And with me tonight, we have our arborist, Ricky Pederica. Ricky is going to speak not only to the trees, but also he's done a lot of diligence on the relocation route that this house will be taking when hopefully it finds its new home on Fremont. We have my uh, law partner, Tyler Hudson, our project architect, Stephen Smith, with the architecture firm of Cooper Johnson Smith, and then the owner and the developer, John Touchton, along with his wife, Susan. And I always think it's a good habit to tell a board what we are going to be presenting. Quite simply, I'm going to be speaking to the what of what we're presenting. John is going to be speaking to the why we are bringing this project before you. And then finally, Ricky and Steve will be speaking to the how. So on to what is it that we're presenting. We have two requests in front of you this evening. The first is for a certificate of appropriateness, approving the relocation of the structure that is currently on 815 South Rome Avenue to what we believe is a much more suitable location at 910 South Fremont Street. Ricky and Steven are both going to be discussing the specifics of the relocation and its appropriateness. In particular, they'll be discussing the mechanics of the standards that are under 27-116 for applications to demolish or relocate structures in Hyde Park. We believe that we meet all the applicable standards and we have worked closely with staff and other experts to assure that we do. <clears throat> if you have any questions as to any of the particular standards, we're happy to answer them. I thought there was, I think once they present, it'll kind of come to life. I'm a visual type person, um, but if there's any specific details you want us to address at the end, we'd be happy to do it. Then our second request is for your recommendation to rezone the property at 815 South Rome Avenue from RS 50 to plan development. We're proposing one use and one use only, and that's office, business, and professional. This, uh, this structure you might have seen over the years, it's taken various forms from a massage parlor to a coffee shop uh, to a home. It's actually zoned RS 50. And, but given all those other uses, 
we feel like this is not only the most appropriate, but from a parking and transportation impact, it's the least of all. And so we are uh, confirming for the record, and we'll have some speakers that will acknowledge our assurance that we have one use and one use only, and that's office, business, and professional, which we think is the most appropriate and the least impactful from a traffic standpoint. Then I do have, I'll submit it at the end just for uh, sake of, of fluidness, but I've got a memo that addresses each of the, the criteria under the code as it relates to PD applications. And then finally, in connection with the PD request, we are seeking three waivers. All three of these waivers result from our discussions with the neighbors and the stakeholders in the area. The three waivers are, one, to reduce the required number of parking spaces from 23 to 16 spaces. And our thought on that was we've got a suburban parking code, unfortunately, in the city of Tampa. And the last thing that we would want in this area is to overbuild a sea of parking and so in talking with traffic consultants and talking with the neighbors and knowing what John wants to do with the property as well as what that one singular use is, we feel that that reduction is appropriate and is better for the district as a whole. Our second waiver is to reduce the required use buffer along the north property line from 15 feet with a six foot CMU wall to three feet with the existing fence it's actually the wrought iron fence that you saw when Ron was showing the pictures of the townhomes located on the north. Uh, they would, that the northern neighbor would like to keep that fence. And so that would be the existing fence would be substituted over the CMU wall. And that's the fence that's shared with that townhome development on the north. And then finally, our last waiver is to reduce the required vehicular use area buffer along the alley from eight feet to five feet. And, and you'll see from <clears throat> what Stephen presents that what this has enabled us to do is instead of having any parking either on the front of the property or on the side of the property, which is how it currently is, it neatly tucks behind the property and is accessed on Bristol. That's the only access. It'll be walled so you won't see any parking at all. So we thought from a design and aesthetic standpoint, that would be the best thing to remove it from the back with Rome being such a high visibility area as the entrance into the village. And, but that design feature necessitated those two variances on the, the buffer as well as the, as well as the vehicular use area. I have a separate memo, which I'll introduce that goes over the waiver criteria in detail for each three of those requests. And then again, just as on the relocation, at the end of our presentation, if you have any questions on the, either the PD criteria or the waiver justifications, we're happy to try to answer those. And then finally, and before I turn things over, I want to thank staff, in particular Dennis and Ron, uh, for working with us. This is an out-of-the-box idea, and while we think it makes total sense and we're confident that you will too, uh, these things don't come neatly. And um, so we've worked with them closely from the beginning, all cards on the table, and they, through their efforts, have made this a much better project, and we thank them for that. And then I also want to commend John Touchton. Um, again, cards on the table from the beginning, and he has literally reached out to any and everybody that would talk to him about this project. And so the outreach has been unprecedented, and I think you'll see tonight um, the result of that outreach. And with that, I'm going to support, or I'm going to submit for the record the two memos, and then we have 13 letters of support from neighbors. John has an illustration showing where those neighbors are in particular. And so for the record, I'm going to submit, which can be passed to each of you, copies of both the memos as well as copies of the 13 letters of support. And with that, we thank you for your time, and I'll turn things over to, uh, to John.
I was uh, putting down a document. Oh, perfect. Thank you, Truett, and uh, thanks to all of you on the ARC for your consideration of this application. Again, I'm John Touchton. I live at 2916 Villa Rosa in South Tampa um, and here to speak on behalf of this project. I'll, I'll start with some commentary on the relocation of the house currently at 815 South Rome being moved to 910 South Fremont. Uh, on Rome, we have a beautiful, historically significant house on a challenging lot hemmed in by the high-intensity shopping and dining district across the street, while on Fremont, we have a house that is inconsistent with the number of historically significant homes around it. My goal in this relocation is to put the right house on the right lot. I'm gonna let Ricky Pederica go through the details of the moving of the house, but on that part of the application, I'll just say that the approach that we are taking in moving it is to protect the, the tree canopy at all cost, uh, and to minimize inconvenience to the neighbors on the route as much as possible. I'll also say that I am committed to rededicating the house once moved as a contributing structure for historical designation purposes. Turning to the redevelopment of the 815 South Rome lot in my PD application, my plan is to redevelop the property with a low intensity office building that is residential in size and scope and consistent with the design aesthetic of the neighborhood. This property, as Truett alluded to, and as many of you may know, uh, has a long and somewhat checkered past. Uh, it has had a number of non-conforming commercial uses over the last 40 years, and its location directly across the street from Fabici Restaurant and Hyde House and the South Parking Garage to the Hyde Park Retail Area has become problematic as a single-family residence. Stephen Smith, my architect, will present the building in more detail, and as he shares these details, it's important to keep the context of this specific location in mind. What I am proposing at 815 South Rome is a transitional use for a uniquely transitional property. The building will not be an encroachment into the residential neighborhood to the south and west, but rather an end cap to the commercial district and a buffer to the neighborhood behind it. Understanding the unique and sensitive heritage of Hyde Park, I approached this project in collaboration with the neighbors. I've had a, num a number of meetings with them, both individually and in small groups, and I'm glad to say that all immediate neighbors with whom I have spoken are supportive of all aspects of the projects. Um, you see uh, on your screen is a list, uh, is a map showing uh, the property in question with the star. Uh, all of the properties in dark green around it are people who have written letters of support. All of those in lighter green are, uh, are people who have given uh, verbal support and have conveyed my, their willingness to have me share uh, their support uh, verbally to you all as well. Um, nobody has been opposed to uh, the project uh, that I've spoken to and I have tried to reach out to as many people as I could. Um, I'll close by saying that uh, I appreciate the fact that any change in Hyde Park, especially change that comes with moving a 100-year-old house and rezoning a property, has to clear a very high bar, uh, both with the neighborhood and with you on the ARC. And uh, I hope I've cleared that bar with this proposal. Um, to be totally clear, I am not a developer. I'm a private investor. Uh, this building uh, will be for my personal business use. Uh, in that it will be owner-occupied, and I'm going to have to live with the consequences of the decisions that I make in building it. Uh, if I'm able to move forward, um, I will make the same promise to you that I have made to the neighbors. This will be a high-quality, tasteful, low-intensity project. I'll do it right, and I'll be a good neighbor in the process. So with that, I'm going to thank you all for your time. I also want to thank uh, Ron and Dennis for their help in shepherding this through. Uh, as you understand full well and as Truett um, uh, explained, uh, there are a lot of steps in this and um, I appreciate my team and their involvement, uh, the support of the neighbors, uh, and support, of, uh, support of staff, but um, coordination of staff in this process. So thanks very much and Ricky, I'll turn it to you.
Good evening. Committee members, Ricky Paterica, 308 East 7th Avenue. I have been sworn. Uh, I'm a landscape architect, board certified master arborist, and certified planner. Uh, I'm going to dramatically attempt to dramatically simplify this uh, relocation effort into three steps. Um, the first step will be to um, portion the 815 South Rome property into four portions. Um, the inside of the structure will be internally braced with, um, with wood members. The siding will be removed and severed along the yellow lines depicted roughly just above the pent roof and generally down this axis. This is another view of the side. The chimney will be disassembled and, and um, transported separately. Um, the upper halves will be, or one upper half will be taken down, preferably South Rome Avenue, on a, taken on a flatbed trailer down South Rome Avenue, um, west onto Morrison, and then into position, sorry, into position in the site here. The two upper halves will be unified first in place, the two stories. Um, then the upper story will be elevated above the final position and then the lower store, the lower halves will be brought along the same route, uh, unified, and then the upper half will be lowered in place for the final uh, reassembly of the structure. Um, I have um, done a field assessment of both routes for tree conflicts, that, which there are a few minor conflicts on Bristol and uh, less conflicts but slightly larger tree limbs here. Um, in the relocation plan, we've committed to uh, arbor supervision throughout the relocation for each step. Uh, and at the final site, there is a, or at the receiving site, there's a grand tree that will be protected during the assembly, the reassembly. And I'm available for any additional questions. And I'd like to invite uh, the architect for the reassembly, uh, Mr. Stephen Smith. Thank you, Commissioners. Uh, Stephen Smith, Cooper Johnson Smith, Peterson Architects and Town Planners. Um, we have a small portion of this, and that is the foundation and, and new stem wall for the relocation. Uh, so I wanted to show you uh, the diagram of what we're doing there. Um, the, uh, the relocation, uh, with the relocation, the residents will meet all of the, uh, the setbacks uh, so there are no variances uh, that we were asking for for this. Uh, and uh, 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 the, uh, uh, the plan right now is to put it back in its original form. Uh, we're not planning to carry the addition that was added at some time on the rear that's non-contributing with it. Uh, and, um, and we'll restore the shed dormer that runs along the rear of the residents along with new openings there. Um, wanted to show you the um, photograph of uh, really the only new work uh, for the residents, which is uh, a brick uh, stem wall, foundation wall. Uh, and we're proposing to go back with uh, as close of a brick as we can find. Uh, in terms of color uh, to emulate its original brick. Uh, it's exposed not only at the base, but also at the, at the chimney 
fireplace area. Uh, the vents will be similar to the original ones with a, uh, with a wire uh, and a, a painted wood frame around it. Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. Stating, but as it relates to the relocation, that was the testimony given by Mr. Pederica and Mr. Stephen there was our full testimony on the relocation. And so with that, Stephen's gonna move into the rezoning aspect, which I touched on both in my initial presentation as well as in the memo. And um, so just wanted to make that segue and then, Ron, I don't know, I think you might have wanted me to allude to this, but as Stephen was going through the relocation, and as Ron demonstrated in his, uh, his picture tutorial, on the Fremont site, there is a structure in the rear that currently has uh, three rental units in it, as well as, and that's a contributing structure. And then the odd thing is the structure in the front that actually fronts Fremont is a non-contributing structure and so once we learned and we did some research and in fact it did turn out that the rear portion is contributing we sought and received a formal determination wanting to keep that and so in essence what we'll be left with are two units in the rear so going down from three to two in the rear contributing and then now fortunately for this location the house that ideally we'll be moving from Rome to Fremont, will also be contributing. So we'll really round that lot out and everything on it will end up being contributing. So with that, I'll turn things back over to Stephen for the rezoning portion. Thank you, Truett. Um, uh, for this portion the re with the rezoning, I wanted to first say that that uh, as architects and planners, we don't take rezonings lightly. Um, and we usually get involved when there are situations with good planning principles uh, are at odds with an existing uh, zoning map. And the zoning maps tend to be either overly simplistic or, or generally outdated. And I think our situation is, is uh, a zoning map that really is predominantly residential single family all the way around the village, uh, just doesn't have the complexity and, and never really entertained the sort of mixed use that a neighborhood and town center has and all the things that occur in the historic district. Um, in fact, if we were to rebuild Hyde Park uh, as it, as it uh, was um, historically, it would be a quilt work of, of PDs um, to accommodate all the rich variety that we have there. Um, the wonderful thing about it is we have um, we have six-story apartment buildings next to single-family houses. We have four and six and even eight-unit apartment buildings that are that are perfectly comfortable next to houses. We have schools. We have churches. Uh, we one of those schools used to be a gas station surrounded by houses. So it is the rich variety of a place like Hyde Park. And so what we're proposing, and John alluded to it, is a better use for what has occurred and has developed in Hyde Park over the decades. Um, I've got a photo of, of Hyde Park. Uh, this, is, this is recent, uh, but it's, it's of the part of, of, of the village that I remember as a kid, and really there wasn't a whole lot more to the village than this. There was an ice cream parlor and a gazebo and some surface parking. And when it was in this generation, uh, it, it worked well with single family houses. But now this is, is the current reality, which is 
uh, natural for a neighborhood uh, and what has become a regional uh, uh, neighborhood center in its probably third generation of development. And so with our location, which is essentially at the end of the axes uh, of Snow Avenue, we now are more of a site that participates in the mixed use commercial center than a residence that once sat near those small shops. I mean, we have nearly a thousand seats of, uh, of restaurant uh, seating now. Uh, we have hundreds of thousands of square footage of office and retail. So um, it's, it, it just seems like now's the time. We've seen that structure languish uh, in terms of its usage. We've heard all kinds of anecdotal stories from the former owners in terms of folks regularly wandering up, wanting to know where the restrooms are, um, parking in that parking lot, running to someplace in Hyde Park Village, on and on uh, to the point where there's always a big sign there that says private property in, in, in red letters, no parking, um, beware sort of thing. So uh, it, it really does seem like it's time. Just a little bit more on what you see when you pull up there. Um, moving on to uh, what we're proposing, and John described it uh, very well. We, we want to propose the kind of transitional building that works well between the kind of mixed use that we have in the village and the residences towards the end of the block. Um, you'll see that PDs have been passed uh, uh, um, uh, have been granted in the past for other areas surrounding us. Uh, in fact, I'll show you a quick PD map. Oops, okay. Our site is uh, with the green outline. Um, uh, to the north is the, uh, the, co the freestanding condominiums that are in a sort of fortified courtyard. Um, and then to the immediate south are, um, are a series of duplexes. So it seems like really surrounding this important entry into the Commercial Avenue, the properties have over time uh, developed a degree of defensiveness uh, there and have become something different than freestanding houses. Start with a quick orientation. This is uh, this is a survey of existing conditions, um, showing the outline of the existing house, um, showing the sidewalks and uh, trees on the surrounding property. There has not been any development on the other portions of the site. There's presently a driveway uh, and ribbon uh, ribbon uh, driveway uh, on the property. There are. There is an abandoned uh, set of stairs in a concrete retaining wall that we can talk about later, uh, as well as there's another set over in this area of the property. Uh, orientation again, sorry, Rome and Bristol. Um, what we're proposing is uh, a building with a footprint that is towards the front of the property with parking in the rear. Uh, and what we want to create here is an office building that is residential in nature, residential in scale, meets uh, the height limits, meets appropriate setbacks as residents, uh, as, as residences would. Uh, and then with a, a, a small parking area, that we see as a parking court that would be in a landscaped courtyard. So our goal is that when folks are, are driving by or passing by, walking by this property, you're not looking, you're not seeing the cars. Um, it, uh, our hopes are is that it's, that it's uh, almost the massing of a house 
and then with a backyard is the feel of it. Similar site plan that's just a little bit easier on the eyes and shows uh, how we plan to do that. Um, we have an entrance to uh, the parking area off of Bristol. Um, in, in early iterations, we had access off of the alley, but surrounding residents were, were, were very, very uh, firm in that they would prefer it, our access to be off of Bristol. So uh, we redesigned the parking for that. Um, we're proposing that there is a low fence or wall that encloses uh, that area, uh, much as the backyard would of a residence. We would have some, uh, some gates that would be opaque uh, and appropriately designed. And then we would, uh, we would provide hedging, tall hedging around that, uh, so that, um, again, it would be in excess of six feet high. Uh, we are uh, working to preserve uh, a number of oaks that are on the site. There's a substantial one over in this corner. Uh, we did have to, or we are proposing to remove uh, uh, one oak in the center uh, and a pear uh, down in this area of the, of the property. When it comes to uh, the massing and the elevations of a very early concept, we, we really wanted to only show massing and a sense of scale, but, uh, but, but if and when this project proceeds further, um, in talking with, uh, with, with John, uh, there's a, 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 a wonderful uh, house, the Lehman House, that we're using as some inspiration. Uh, it's a prairie-style house, uh, which was an early transitional style from uh, traditional architecture to modern architecture, arts and crafts to modern, and it is something that we would love to use as inspiration moving ahead. Some massing elevations uh, that uh, where we're showing an entrance from the, uh, the Rome side, Roman snow side, uh, as well as entrance from uh, an entry from the parking lot side. Um, the south elevation is the corner uh, where we might have a, a, a bay window that projects into uh, or towards that corner uh, to give some relief there. And then along the north elevation, that's where we are 14 feet from the condominium buildings. And in, in some initial planning, we have an internal stair, so not a great deal of openness there. To give you a feel of the real impact of this building, um, there are so many oaks surrounding it. We, we uh, created a quick model and inserted it into photographs of the site. So this is a view coming down Snow Avenue. Um, it just so happens to have one of the vehicles parked on the island, which almost every time I'm over there, there's some kind of delivery vehicle or something parked in front of the site. This is uh, the southeast corner, uh, so Bristol and Rome. A view from the south southwest um, uh, looking towards the corner of Rome. Um, also showing this concept of, of a landscaped area, a low wall or fence, and then a hedge uh, tall enough to conceal parking beyond. This is also showing the idea of a gate that, that, uh, uh, that also screens the parking beyond.
All right, that uh, concludes my presentation. Uh, let me know if you have any questions. Thank you. I'll switch over to this one while Steven's cleaning up over there. Again, Truett Gardner, 400 North Ashley Drive. The one thing I was just looking at the criteria for the relocation that we did not cover, and I just wanted to put this in for the record, but John and Ricky both spoke to numerous movers, and one of the criteria is on the ability to successfully move it and to try to ensure its structural integrity. And the mover that has been selected is uh, Mark Roche, and uh, family-owned business, over 45 years of experience in moving structures. Notably, he moved the Bigelow Mansion and uh, numerous residential structures along the Veterans Expressway, the Heritage Park Historical Museum, the Ybor City Historical Society property or structure, and then most recently, which I believe was in front of you, the house that uh, David Laxer is relocating from Howard Avenue to Jaton Avenue. So just wanted to put that in for the record as well as far as the selection of the mover. And with that, that concludes our presentation. Again, we're happy to answer any questions on the relocation, on the PD application, on the variances. But in summary, we think that the house that's currently on room will be much better suited at its new location on Jaton will really round that property out and make everything on it historically designation, designated, which is our commitment. And then as far as what goes back on Rome, we think we've got a great owner in John Touchton, a great architect in Stephen Smith, and it'll serve as a great transitional use from the density and the intensity of the High Park Historic District stepping down to the residential neighborhood behind it with Kate Jackson on the other side as well. So with that, happy to answer any questions you may have. John, do you have anything else you want to say? No, we'll, we'll stand for questions. Thank you. Um, at this point, staff will now present the staff report. Good evening, commissioners. Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservation. Uh, staff received a complete packet to address all the items that are uh, held within Chapter 27, 116, F1 1 and 2, which addresses uh, relocation within the historic district. I do have 13 letters of support, and they are filed in the, f the packet. I have uh, Mary Samaneo here and John, and she's with zoning, and I have John Marsh with transportation, if there's any additional questions uh, directed towards staff. The additional bullet items that uh, we have listed on page three of the staff report is that uh, the receiving site with the contributing structure that was there, currently there's three individual units there and then they have a primary structure. Eric Cotton, the supervisor with the zoning department, uh, put out a, a uh, formal determination that they could have three units on that parcel. So as part of this, if it moves forward, that could be a condition attached to the receiving site, that it complies with the formal determination that came out of the zoning department. Uh, also that I asked the team to demonstrate that the footprint at the receiving site does not require any variances. Early on, uh, the structure uh, sat down and there was a, an issue with the north elevation that I think has been corrected and they can show that on the receiving site site plan. They talked about the sensitivity that is required to surgically um, cut the structure and then reassemble on the receiving site. And the, the, one of the reasons for taking the, the structure apart is that it could fit down the streets and not intrude into the canopies of the trees. Another condition that should be attached to uh, this request if it does move forward is that they make a, an attempt uh, at a application in front of the Historic Preservation Commission to redesignate the structure to a contributing structure. And then also at the receiving site to provide additional information on the front yard setback that's consistent with the block average and elevation from grade. 
I don't believe that was addressed this evening. With that, uh, I'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Kamaria pettis from the city attorney's office. I just want to clarify when staff just mentioned, Mr. Vila mentioned the formal determination from Mr. Cotton. Just for the record, if that does proceed, the, the um, official reference should be FDN 21-02. Thank you. May I have that number again, please? Sorry, F. D N two one dash zero two. Thank you very much. Don't know whether this is the time for that, but as far as the conditions that Ron mentioned and speaking on behalf of John so and Susan. At this point, what we'll do is we're going to ask any for any public comment. And okay, then after perfect. that, we're going to open and we'll, we can ask questions. I, I was just going to acknowledge that we're fine with all those conditions. Okay. Thank you. All right. At this point, we'll open the public hearing to any public comment, either for or against. Um, we're going to focus on just the relocation portion now and not the rezoning. Good evening. My name is William Kestelik. I am the property owner at 912 South Fremont, adjacent to the uh, target property for the house. Uh, uh, and the move and as a resident of Hyde Park, I'd like to say that that this project uh, in general and as a whole has my endorsement. Um, I think it would be a positive structure to be placed on Fremont and I believe the redeveloped parcel on Rome slash snow would be an attribute to that area as well. Thank you. And if possible, as you come up to speak, could you alternate between um, either microphone to make sure that one is clean? Thank you. Um, I have comments on both issues for efficiency. You don't want me to do it all together? No, ma'am. If you could okay. also make sure you uh, state and spell your name. But for this one, it will just be on the relocation. OK. My name is Mary Lou Bailey. I own the property at 810 South Packwood Avenue. It's immediately behind the house across the alley and up one block. So very, very close. Um, I've been a very active citizen in Hyde Park. I've lived here for 25 years. I'm often involved in zoning and preservation matters. I was previously the president of Historic Hyde Park Neighborhood Association. I serve today as the president of, Lect of Hyde Park Preservation. When I heard that they wanted to do this, I was originally very skeptical. And um, I've been a changed woman. So I've come around, I've done a lot of work and research and have, have become comfortable. And I'm here tonight um, telling you that I think it's appropriate to relocate this house and later we'll talk about the rezoning. The reason I think it's appropriate to relocate this house, we're not losing a contributing structure, which I wouldn't want to do in Hyde Park as a protector of Hyde Park. It's simply moving a few blocks away and I think it's moving to a more suitable location. And it's gonna be a win-win because it's an upgrade at the receiving site. Um, also, there are clear precedents of relocating um, historic, uh, historically significant and designated houses. My other reason for supporting this is I'm a huge tree lover. Um, one of the defining characteristics of Hyde Park is our wonderful canopy. And of course, um, there's so many health benefits to all of us of a good, healthy canopy. So I'm very uh, pleased that the project is going to the extent that it is, even though it's so expensive, to protect the trees along the route and to repair any damage that happens along the way. Same thing at the um, receiving site. So those are all the reasons that I'm support, supportive of relocating the historic structure. Thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else that would like to speak either for or against? Okay. Um, at this point, the commissioners will now ask questions for the relocation portion only. Any commissioners like to begin? Uh, I have a passing question uh, respecting the nature of the business decision, uh, perhaps on the back end uh, for the relocation. I can understand how uh, the relocation uh, formulates the backbone for a new commercial development. However, the relocation in and of itself uh, is an arduous task and it has its own intended expenses respecting 
the restoration of the building and its accessory structures on the existing site. Are you doing this on a speculative basis or do you actually have someone interested in this property with this new relocation? Thank you for your question. Um, direct answer is, is speculative um, to the extent that you are also uh, trying to understand the business rationale. Uh, I think I would say so am I. Um, <laughs> the, uh, I this is a passion project for me. Uh, mm -hmm. The ultimate goal was, was the project uh, at 815 South Rome, uh, but uh, the time that I've spent in, in the neighborhood and in Hyde Park um, made it clear to me that uh, uh, that protecting this house was uh, a, something that had to be done, and over time came to the point where I was I was happy to see it done, and thought it should be done. Um, it is a beautiful house; it's a st historically important house. Um, but to your specific question, I do not have a, a buyer or their rental units right now. Um, I have not decided to have, if I'm going to keep them as rental units or if I'm going to uh, sell it as a single-family home. Um, I haven't made that decision yet but um, had to get through today first. Thank I you very much. Thank you. Um, so I have a question in regards to the relocation itself. Were other options looked at in terms of renovating and or adding to the historic property to allow you to have um, a useful, economically feasible um, property without relocating? the historic structure, if there were other options that were looked at. I'd say I considered it a, a bit. Um, the house is in significant disrepair uh, right now, and um, Stephen can, can speak to the the finer points of this, but my understanding is that if you're going to keep a house historic, and I'm really talking out of my depth here, but you have to have the uh, the current house uh, basically be primary on uh, on the structure. If I were to add on to it, um, uh, the only way to make that work in terms of what my my target goal and size was, um, I wouldn't be able to add enough square footage without losing the primacy of the of the historic structure. Does that answer your question? It, it does, um, but another part of my question was, did you actually, did you look at solutions, potential solutions? So were there actual uh, design discussions? You know, did you look at schematic design solutions that might have incorporated the historic property? The historic structure on the property before moving to complete relocation. Yes, but it, again, my understanding was that it came down to um, the the size of the house relative to the size of the of the ultimate structure that I had planned to have. There would be no way to that by adding on the square footage that I contemplated with the new. Um, that in doing that, I would lose the character of the current historic structure, and it would no longer qualify as a contributing historic structure if I did that. Understood. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Commissioner DeCubis, do you have any questions? No, I don't. So I have a question for, um, I mean, it might be for multiple people, but there was a two things kind of that were mentioned today. The first one was there are a couple of conflicts in terms of the actual trees and limbs kind of through the movement of the routes. Wanted to know if you could kind of go through that and describe what those conflicts are. And then the second one was an item that you just mentioned in terms of one of the reasons for not wanting to use the house as it sits now was the, um, it is in a, a level of, or a kind of a state of just probably not as good of a condition as what it would be or could be for a uh, office. And is that gonna play into a relocating it and could cause any issues?
Ricky Pederica again. Uh, I'll speak to the tree portion. Uh, the conflicts present along the route are um, one to four inch diameter branches that overhang here, here, and here on the Bristol route. And on the Morrison route, there's really very few except for some um, maybe four to six inch branches here. There's a potential that these could be temporarily lifted along this route. That's less likely here and they'll need to be a, a pruning specification here, relatively minor pruning dose, but um, this specific level of pruning we were wanted to speak with city staff when we're further along in design. But that, it basically these three areas on Route 2, uh, just this area on Route 1, um, are the conflicts that, we, that I, I expect based on walking the route with a 15-foot uh, telepole to check where the limbs are. The actual maximum height we anticipate of the second story relocated portion is uh, 15 feet at the ridge. Um, we may be able to pull the structure left or right to avoid a limb or actually lift a limb, um, but that's very fine grain uh, kind of a tree work that part of the arbor supervision on site during the move is, is there is proposed to address. And then I guess while you have this sure. diagram up real quick, I'm assuming that the, the sort of the, the turning radius is that you have around here that has all been looked at and reviewed and there's no issues in terms of getting the actual vehicles through there with the house? Uh, route one is more forgiving in providing those turning radii. Um, this is a trick, uh, not really a design vehicle. This is, this is a semi that we're proposing. What they're, what they're actually using with the front loader has a more custom um, radii or, and it's gonna be slower speed and will be able to turn sh more sharply. Um, but even with a relatively large turn of a WB60 tractor trailer, we can make more comfortable turns on the Morrison route than we can at this turn on the Bristol route. Yeah. But uh, we wanted to keep this option open if, in, in case the Bristol route option open in case there were some unforeseen circumstance that we came across on the Morrison route. Okay. In terms of your fine grain comment, uh, am I to assume that really the first section you all are going to be moving uh, is really more of an experiment in, in, in which is going to be the best and easiest route? Uh, solve those problems and the rest follow? We expect that, that there'll be a little playing by ear at what happens along the route. Uh, there'll probably be some utility, uh, uh, there's some service line drops mm -hmm. on Morrison that will get addressed appropriately, um, but I think we're going to see that as it comes. There may be some pruning cuts beforehand on the Morrison turn or the Fremont turn, um, but it's all where the actual cut is, where it lands on the building, and what it sits at when it's on the trailer is still, we're leaving mm -hmm. that open for kind of feeling out as we go. At this time, has the transport company also walked the route with, with the yep. owner or whomever and felt comfortable about both, both of these routes? And he felt more comfortable with the Morrison route okay. when we walked it. It's a wider right of way on, on Rome, uh, more forgiving corner here at uh, Rome and Morrison and at Morrison at Fremont. Okay. I have a question for staff. Thank you. Um, the condition of, you know, the list of conditions, they did not talk about the yard, set, the front yard set back on the elevation from grade. Is that something that we need from them today or is that just a condition for moving forward? As they move forward and they pro provide the additional documentation, we're gonna have to, uh, Get that information clear. That information and um, the abutting structures 
the elevation from grade and the setbacks to be consistent with the block. Gotcha. Thank you. That elevation, and for those, those measurements are, sorry, are provided on the submitted site plan oh, okay. currently. I, I didn't see that. It's really small. Yeah, I, I apologize. <laughs> uh, just the, they're there. The we um, I have to. It's small for me too. I, uh, we have a 23.8 foot front setback, average along the street, and a 25 inch uh, f, um, elevation from grade, vertical um, finished floor elevation that we are proposing for between the two structures north and south. So that's done for if, if I may, you had asked a question about the structural integrity of the of the house, um, and something obviously I was very interested in as well, given the the age and state of the house. And I'm assured by Mark Rush, the house mover, who again has done a lot of these, uh, that it it'll it'll move. That that also reminds me. Do you also have a structural engineer on board, in addition to your architect? Uh, not at this time. Do you intend on bringing someone on board before the house is moved or just relying on the transportation company? There's always risk that you have to manage. Yes, and um, we've actually had two projects with this mover and they are amazing. And it seems like all of the shoring of the residents um, is something that they do um, in those past projects uh, it's really just been the foundation work where there has been an outside consultant like our engineer on that but it's amazing these for three generations these folks have pulled these buildings apart and put them back together um, if there is a particular issue uh, we would find out or you know do they want to go to their engineer that they use all the time Understood. Thank you. I have a question for staff. Um, since the building will be relocated to a new site, but is going to have some exterior changes to that, do, would we typically be reviewing what those, what that building will look like in its final state, or is that something that we would look at at a later date? Good evening, commissioners. Sam, Dennis. You hear me now? Yes. Good evening. Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager. For this evening's hearing, you're just uh, considering the relocation from the existing site to the receiving site. They'll have to subsequently get a, a certificate of appropriateness for any uh, improvements to that. Uh, we'll evaluate that at a staff level. If it uh, warrants a board review, it'll have to come back. Thank you. Um, one other thing I wanted to add. Uh, uh, is that if you feel that uh, the project necessitates structural engineering oversight, that is considered a reasonable condition that could be placed on a uh, approval. Thank you. Are there any additional questions from my fellow commissioners for the re relocation portion only? I have none. Okay. Well, or staff. All right. At this point, the applicant is allowed five minutes for a rebuttal for anything regarding the relocation. Gardner 400 North Ashley Drive, I believe we've covered anything. If you have any additional questions, we stand by happy to answer and appreciate uh, Mary Lou and the other neighbor for showing up and expressing their support for this and hopefully we'll proceed with this and move on to the uh, rezoning aspect. So thank you for your time and consideration. At this point, the public hearing will now be closed and the commissioners will discuss the case. Um, do any of my fellow commissioners have anything they'd like to state? Um, I have none. I think it's a very thoughtful plan um, that will be carefully um, brought to life. 
Um, I think with these conditions of the zoning department and maybe we add the structural engineer in there. I'm pretty comfortable with it. Overall, I think it's a, it's a strong project for the district, um, you know, reuniting two disparate units and creating a, a parcel with uh, co um, contributing structures overall is nice. Um, I know this, I know this property well. Um, my kids mm -hmm. went to Kate Jackson for years after school. Um, one, one concern that I have is, um, is, is related to the moving, um, especially since the client, the owner, um, did state that there was some concern about its state. So just documentation from someone licensed in the state of Florida, whether it be the structural engineer that the transportation company uses or another one that the owner brings on that validates that the move did not um, in any way um, harm the, the historic structure, I think would be uh, a valid condition to place on this proposed relocation. It's a two-story structure, you know, when it's a one-story structure, I. I I'm a little bit more comfortable with it, but because it has so much to it, it has a lot of ins and outs and details and the, the, the chimney itself, mm -hmm. and you're cutting into, you're proposing to cut it into four pieces, it's, it's really kind of a concern. Agreed, yeah. absolutely agreed. So that's, that's all I have in terms of concerns about that. Okay, I think it's also important to make sure if, depending on the um, recommendation of the board and commission we make sure we do include the formal determination from zoning the FDN 21-02 um, as well as the the condition of submitting an application to the Historic Preservation Commission to redesignate it as a contributing structure so those would be those three conditions <laughs> Well, actually, if, it's the list of the conditions that are on page three. Mm -hmm. And then, are there any other items anyone would like to discuss? No. And then I think not, this is ready to go. Okay. Would Commissioner, I'd like to make a motion. I would like to make a motion. If that's okay. Yes. Move to grant, sorry, move to grant a certificate of appropriateness for the drawings and documents presented at this public hearing in ARC 20-447. I think you're reading the wrong one. Am I reading the wrong one? It should no, be the should one on the bottom. the bottom. Oh, I'm so sorry. <laughs> um, move to grant a certificate of appropriateness to relocate for ARC 20-447 for the property located at 815 South Rome Avenue in as much as the agent has satisfied the agent has satisfied the requirements of chapter 27 section 27-116F of the City of Tampa Court Code of Ordinances I second the motion Oh wait oh, I'm s oh. Uh, you can add, we add in the conditions You can add conditions We just added yes. <laughs> I'm sorry I'm sorry with the following conditions that the agent provide documentation of the outcome of the formal determination from zoning uh, FDN 21-02 at the receiving site, that they, the owner agent demonstrate the footprint of the receiving site does not require variances, that um, an, an example of the foundation brick is provided, that um, the method of cutting the structure and reassembling it is provided, um, that the owner agent submit an application to the Historic Preservation Commission to redesignate as a con contributing structure, that um, a site plan is submitted with information regarding the front yard setback and elevation from grade that is consistent with the block fabric, and that a structural engineer report be provided after relocation certifying that the historic structure is um, has not been <coughs> compromised. No, I'll second. And then before we vote, can either the agent or the owner um, 
just go on record saying that they understand the conditions and are okay with those? Uh, yes, Truck Gardner 400 North Ashley Drive. I talked to my client with our mask on and, and we agreed <laughs> to all those. In fact, most of it's already been presented. The one ad is the structural engineer and he confirmed that he's absolutely fine with that. With the expense given and moving, he's gonna wanna make sure that the integrity of that structure is maintained. Thank you. And having the second, um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? All right, motion passes, thank you. Um, at this point, staff will now present the staff report for the um, rezoning portion. Thank you, commissioners. Ron Vila uh, with Historic Preservation. Under Chapter 27, 113, your duties and powers are as such with regards to the application for rezoning, lane use changes, or comprehensive plan amendments to review and recommend reasonable lane use changes to the extent necessary to preserve the historic integrity and appearance of the historic district. Staff's findings that this application is consistent with ch Chapter 27, 113. There were a couple conditions that were attached on the staff report. Uh, they were addressed through the presentation. One was to discuss all the waivers. He had indicated those. If additional discussion is needed on the waivers, I believe Mr. Gardner could go through those. And then at the site at 815 Rome, there is uh, some historic fabric that's at the site with that uh, retaining wall. And I'd like for them to discuss how they plan on retaining that on site with the move and the new construction. Uh, that concludes this portion for me, and I'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you. At this point, we will open the public hearing to any public comment for the rezoning. I'm still Mary Lou Bailey, 810 South Packwood Avenue. I'd like you to um, support this rezoning under a PD to the least intensive of the uses, business professional office. I'm very comfortable, as are my neighbors, that Mr. Touchton's uh, uh, use of the property will be appropriate in its setting. But because zoning goes with the land into perpetuity, I actually sought out some additional conditions myself, and they've put those into the project, I'm pleased to say. So first of all, I clarified for myself that the code definition excludes medical office and that there's another code definition for personal services. I wouldn't want either of those in this location due to the high traffic and what I've seen happen to the condition of the structures under those uses in our historic district. Um, the petitioner has also included the business hours in the PD. That gives me some assurance in the future that it will be this low use that he's proposing for his own business. And it's opposite the busier times in the village that we see in the weekends and in the evenings, so that's good. Parking will all be done on site, which is very important to us because we have very overcrowded and narrow streets in the historic district. And you won't even really be able to see the parking from the streets or the sidewalks that we often take our strolls on. The vehicle entrance on Bristol is very appropriate. Our alleys are very narrow. We have recycling um, bins out there and trash bins, and we come and go in and out of our back gates with our kids and our bicycles and our scooters, so I don't want any traffic in that alley, so I, I like the entrance being on Bristol. The setback waivers are very typical in the district, and no one is getting any kind of a hardship because of the waivers. And again, all of these things are on the PD, so they stay with it, as you guys well know, but I had to convince myself um, so that in the future, as the property may change hand or something, we're still protected. They're preserving the trees. I already told you about my passion for trees. They're doing the replanting on site, not paying into what I refer to as the slush fund. So I'm pleased about that. And also, um, this is a very uh, fairly unique uh, location, as it's already been described and everybody seems to be familiar with. There's a lot of different uses there. And this is a nice kind of end cap, in my opinion, to, to the village and the transition off into the neighborhood. There have been a lot of uses over the, in this property. Um, a lot of them that really upset me, including a full bore fry cook kitchen going on without proper ventilation and without proper refuse disposal, which brought in rats to our neighborhoods and into my backyard where my children play and took down my citrus tree. And we complained in the city didn't do anything. So, and we've already talked about the other uses. So I'm actually really excited about this use. I think it's very appropriate in the setting and I think it's very respectful um, in its use and in its aesthetics. And also I have some fear. 
this is a high value property. Something will go there and it's no longer really suitable for residential. There's all kinds of protections that he's put into this PD and into the design of the project that make me support it. But I will admit there's some fear that something really bad could happen there, which I don't want to have happen. So to sum it up, I think this is the right, right use of the property, 815 South Rome, and I encourage you to consider my rationale and um, vote to approve it. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you. Anyone else like to speak for or against? Okay. Um, at this point, we will now ask um, the commissioners to ask questions for the rezoning um, portion only. Um, I just wanted to ask if we could walk through those waivers again and maybe with a map this time so we could kind of visualize uh, what you were talking about. Thirteen letters. They address the relocation and the PD. Can you hear me, Truett Gardner? Wow, I'm really loud all of a sudden. Um, so the first three waivers, uh, the first is the fifth letter, which is the reduction in parking from 23 to 16 spaces. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, True. Hello? I'm sorry. <laughs> Maybe if I put my mask over. No, it, it was fine. It just wasn't. We didn't hear it. It was just really loud. <laughs> <laughs> I, don't, I don't like the sound of my own if, voice. If you hold it a little bit away from your face, <laughs> it should be fine. Sounds good. I used to have that problem. I used to eat the microphone. I'm a, I'm a singer, so I like to keep it close to my lips. Uh, again, Truett Gardner, uh, 400 North Ashley Drive. So first waiver is the simplest one to show which is the reduction in parking from 23 to 16. Again, all 16 of those spaces will be in the rear of the property. And um, we feel that the reduction is warranted given the use and given the desire to not have a sea of parking uh, in this location. Then the other two. Could I stop you there? Sure. Can we just ask, did you say that someone from transportation was here? What's the criteria we need to look at going from 23 to 16. He, he just left. Oh, gosh. But um, <laughs> I could touch upon that a little bit. Um, the use and the square footage of the, of the primary structure di dictates how much parking is required. If there's going to be parking from 1 to 25, you have to have one handicapped spot that's illustrated here. And it's usually to the closest route to the entrance, which is provided. Okay. And uh, I'd add, Stephen was whispering in my ear, and John, correct me if I misspeak, but um, he believes that there'll be a total of eight to 10 people in the building at any one time. Am I correct on that? So, really, we felt very comfortable with the 16 providing not only guest spaces, but in, in the event John moves on and this goes to somebody else, mm -hmm. it also gives a little bit of a buffer in case somebody comes in with a slightly <coughs> more intense use. I'm sorry, not intense use, but intense, I mean, intense usage of the traffic, property. Sure. The, the use is limited to business and professional office. Okay. So that's one. The second pertains to this area here, and that is the, under code, a strict compliance with code, the, uh, the buffer along the north property line would be 15 feet, and it would also require a six foot masonry wall along this northern boundary. And on that, what we wanted to do was heavily landscape this area, but in order to move all that parking to the rear, 
we need this entire area back here for those 16 spaces. So that necessitated the need to reduce that buffer from 15 feet to three feet. And John, again, correct me if I'm wrong, but the owner of the townhome immediately to the north who's supportive of the project wanted that existing wrought iron fence to remain and for a masonry wall to not go in place of that. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that's the, the need for the second portion of that waiver, which is to not have the masonry wall and instead have the existing fence. And then the third and final waiver is along the alley. And that's just a three foot reduction of separate from a buffer. It's the vehicular use area from eight feet to five feet. Again, we needed to maintain the proper depth of the two parking stalls on either side, as well as the depth of the drive aisle in the middle. And so that squeezed this area here by three feet, but we will heavily landscape that area and to make sure that it's aesthetically pleasing all the way around. Okay, thank you. If you would please leave that site plan up. I want to address um, the uh, refuse area that you have planned uh, nearby the swing gate entrance to the courtyard parking lot. Uh, it strikes me as being relatively small in scale. Uh, have you had an opportunity to talk with waste management uh, people about the volume of material that you are, uh, that, that could be generated on the site? And is what we're looking at here actually sized adequately for that volume? It's a great question. And we have been through our development review committee um, with all the different departments of the city, including solid waste. And if anybody else wants to jump in, we feel that it can easily be managed with, with rollouts. And <coughs> so those will be located in this area here. And in working with the neighbors, and in particular with, with Mary Lou, we learned that she fought hard to have solid waste pick up along the alley. And so there'll be a swinging door so those rollouts can simply go out onto the alley for, for pickup, but we feel we're adequate as far as the volume of the refuse and then also how it'll be handled and how it'll be screened. So on that subject, knowing that the, the site plan is schematic, it does appear that on that sort of that southwest corner, that retaining or that wall that's gonna be used to hide the parking along the alleyway goes right up to the alleyway in that portion, what would be the intention? So if you're pulling out, you know, one, two, three, however many garbage cans, recycling cans that would, you would typically find in a residential neighborhood and place that on the alleyway, is there enough room now to have those on the alley with the garbage truck kind of coming through or does that need to be redesigned to where it actually fits? I am completely unqualified to answer that question, but I think our, our architect can answer that question. I may be unqualified as well, but it, uh, uh, in Hyde Park, it seems like there's a staggering of the, of the uh, containers, and uh, what we are seeing uh, uh, will happen with this use are, is very similar to what we do at our architect's office, where we generate a lot of paper uh, less than this, but they're re residential scale bins and uh, multiple uh, multiple bins that would be out in that right of way. A lot of times in Hyde Park, I've seen that they kind of congregate on one side mm -hmm. so that there's enough passage of the vehicle there. But we'd be happy to give that more thought. Um, and I, yeah, I guess my question is, if there's not enough room for those cans to be located where it looks like they will be because it will actually be on the alleyway proper. <coughs> what would be the strategy to change that corner to make sure that there is enough room? Um, what something that we could do is actually take the um, take the uh, the screen wall that's around the containers and actually push that and engage uh, with the rear fencing or wall so that we could we could on garbage day open those, uh, open the, uh, uh, the gates for them 
and ask uh, those folks to basically just reach into this alcove and pull them out. So they would be sitting virtually out of the paved area. Okay. Mary Lou Bailey just bailed us out. Apparently, um, probably due to her lobbying, uh, they have smaller garbage trucks uh, for specifically for the alleys in Hyde Park, and she assures me they will fit, uh, including with the, the trash. Am I saying that right? Okay. Cool. Um, so I don't have a question about the waste. Did you have follow-up questions for your waste? Oh uh, no, I don't. Did you? Not about the waste, no. I was going to ask about the tree that's in the corner. That's a 30-inch. Yep. Um, I know this is schematic, but you got to be very careful about what you're indicating because it doesn't work unless you're doing something magical with your wall. So I don't know if somebody wants, if the arborist wants to speak to that or the architect. View and then Ricky can give you the arborist view <laughs> is um, we also have, there's another tree located. Um, yes, the 24 inch, that was also going to be another one. And on the, <coughs> on the rendering, we actually show it depicted more realistically, which is um, at a point that works with the root system. And, and Ricky would be out there and would air spade around the roots of the tree and determine where the major ones are. And then we kind of change from, say, if this were a concrete block wall, which we're, we, we're not sure what it would be in other areas, but we would change to something that is more um, is that's more with uh, a pole oriented, let's just say more fence like material that is placed around those roots and then uh, the fence material spans across. So we would kind of pick our way around the root system. But we know it is very important uh, and the design would reflect that. Sort of like a, a flying grade beam. It, and you know, actually, it, um, We've done that with block walls, but we're thinking as close as we're getting, it's probably going to more of a, a fence-like design that can dance around those roots. So, I have a question. I'm sorry. Go I have ahead. a question for staff. So my understanding is if we approve the rezoning, the site plan that we kind of are given and present, or that is presented tonight, is kind of locks in the, the scale of massing the setback and those items for our review. Again, is there, uh, Kamari pettis from the legal department, you're just making a recommendation. Right, and I, but I guess my question is, once it gets rezoned from, if it does get rezoned from city council, right. we're not able to look at those items because it's already been approved in the PD. Do we have a, a I guess a site plan that's been kind of approved from city and from staff of what that would look like versus a schematic? plan other than what's being presented right here yes ma'am this is what you're you're going to approve now this pd plan is specific but there's some modifications that can be made and you're going to see this again at the the certificate of appropriateness portion of the hearing you know yet to come but my, so i know in previous cases we've had conversations where once the PD, or once the rezoning has been changed, there are, item, there are certain items that we cannot change, and some of those may be locations of, you know, the size of the building, the setbacks, those items. Would any of those cause an issue to where if we're looking at a fence now that later on cannot be located there, does that serve any sort of an issue with an approved site plan? Um, Mary Samaniego, um Growth, uh, development and growth management. Um, yes, the PD site plan, um, once it's approved, when and if it's approved by city council, um, all the improvements have to be on this site plan. And so, um, just for your knowledge, this is the um, official, so this is the draft of the site plan that will go before city council for two public hearings. So what is exactly on that site plan is what can be built down to fencing, parking, landscaping, building placement, setbacks. So then I guess my question is what's presented here for this one, 
there are items that don't match what is presented on the schematic one. That I can't, I can't speak to. Okay. That's what the applicant's presenting, but this is the official site plan that's going to be taken to city council, not the schematic plan. Thank you. Um, a bit of clarification on that. We were using the color site plan to depict some of the, the landscaping concepts, um, but our package, uh, and I, I began the presentation with the exact site <coughs> plan uh, that, uh, that she just mentioned. And on that, we're, we're, we're noting things where they are very general notations, uh, for example, fence or wall, um, and uh, just, just like we have the, the setbacks of the building, it's, it, it really is something that you folks will be able to review for appropriateness. We're trying to give ourselves our setbacks of the footprint, maximum uh, uh, footprint setbacks, and then indicating that we are going to have fence or walls at these locations, but in terms of their, uh, you can review them in terms of their height, their appropriateness of material, design, and so on. I, I have an item for, for consideration in those terms then. The existing building on this site has to a portion, but not entirely of its perimeter, a short transition wall in their landscape between the site property and the public sidewalk. Uh, are you planning on maintaining that and expanding that? or are you going to be producing one entirely? And in either case, how is it indicated on your site plans? And yes, the answer is there is a, um, there is a, a short retaining wall right at the, right at the sidewalk. Mm -hmm. And it varies in nature. I have some photos. Uh, it is our intent to have uh, the set, to have the feature there, and, uh, but it will be new. It, um, I'm stuttering because it's a combination of things. I'll show you. Um, uh, a, a photo of the little poured retaining wall that's at the north corner of the property. Uh, at the tree. Um, it is a little, little bit questionable state. Looks like the tree is pushing out on it a little bit. Um, and then as you move from uh, north to south, there are, um, there's a set of uh, concrete stairs. Again, it's a very modest, humble uh, retaining wall, not, not like some that we'll see that are, are, are uh, of greater stature. Um, this is uh, another step that, that was probably to a house that's no longer there on the south side. And um, in, in, uh, and then giving a fuller picture, this is the corner at Bristol. So at some point, I don't know if it was damaged or removed, but there is uh, kind of modern landscape blocks there. And then beyond it, to the west, it turns into railroad ties. So the only remnant of, of the historic wall is what you see along mm -hmm. Rome. And the intent now is to preserve as much of that as feasible. And uh, even though the alignment of, of the steps and so on, and all of this is literally one foot tall, um, I think it would be interesting as a, as a um, reminder of the history of the site to keep the two stairs. Um, and. Uh, uh, and, and that is our intent, and then to replace it with a like uh, infill portion where the existing driveway is. That's removed at some point. It removed about 15 feet or so of it. Do you think then uh, that the provision of uh, such a significant landscape element uh, should be uh, indicated uh, as uh, as an element on your PD? Uh, documents as much as would be uh, all your fence work and gate work? Um, true, it might need to address that if that is something that we can add to uh, the description. That is 
definitely the intent and definitely what we're committed to. I don't know whether stating that on the record suffices. Um, I don't want to be in the situation of uh, we've Recent, we've addressed all of, staff, all of staff's comments in the site plan, have resubmitted, and I don't believe this would rise to what's deemed to be a substantial change to our site plan. So if that's something that we can add to the site plan, we would be more than happy to accommodate it. If not for the purposes of this record, we are committed to having that well, landscape law. Well, please follow me along with my concern. Uh, you've made certain statements this evening about the provision of or the restoration of or the coordination of such an element. Uh, if the element is not shown on your approved PD, we cannot ask you to provide it later. So one question which I'd defer to, to Dennis perhaps is assuming we get your recommendation tonight and then have the rezoning approved by city council, we'll be right back in front of you for a certificate of appropriateness. So I don't know whether the retaining wall could be addressed as part of the CA, and I'm looking to Dennis to. No. Uh, I, yeah, just to kind of take a step back, Dennis Fernandez, Architecture Review and Historic Preservation Manager, your role here today is to make a recommendation on the site plan that's before you. Mm -hmm. You're going to uh, send your recommendation via your motion to City Council. One of the items that you you can uh, request that are, is added to the site plan is a note to retain the uh, site wall as determined appropriate by the Architecture Review Commission. That could be added, uh, you know, in advance of their PD hearing or be between first and second reading. So that's one way to take care of it. Uh, another way is just the simple fact that if they come in for a CA, you know, staff can note that that's an important fact. We put it in our staff report already. So we, we, will, we will address it. I don't think it's an issue that's gonna necessarily um, slip through because uh, we're very aware of that and the sidewalks and the cartouches and everything that kind of composes the historic public portion of the uh, site. Thank you. I have no further question. Can you put the site plan back up, please? Whoever had it. And can we get that zoomed out, please, Steph? Thank you. Um, did you have a drawing that showed the relationship <coughs> of the property with the neighbors to the north? Yes. Show the context. It is a bit informal um, in that uh, what we did was we took this, um, this diagram and then uh, measured the setbacks of the adjacent properties. I'm glad you're saying that because that was going to be my question. Yes, yes. <laughs> and um, in looking at the combination, um, what we wanted to do was have uh, uh, the, the, the property is, has a slight angle to it. So our intent is to have a, a 15 foot, more or less fractions, setback from uh, the property line along Rome with an area in the center uh, uh, where we can project up to 10 feet. And so that's, that's marked on this plan. And in terms of, of, of justification for it is when you go down Rome, there is a variety. There's quite a bit of stepping in and out um, from the immediate neighbor next door. The, um, uh, the brick condominiums are uh, 20 feet back. Um, thanks, Truett, because it does show that essentially with, lands with hedging and iron fencing, they've created really a fortified looking compound right at the property line but the buildings themselves, the nearest ones, are 20 feet. And then, uh, but then when you, when you continue down, you have 20, 20, and then you get into this area that's really interesting with 10 to 15 foot setbacks. 
and the houses are really gorgeous along there. I have a photo of one of them, but uh, we felt like, uh, especially because of the setbacks uh, with the commercial properties around, we felt like going to this 15 feet for the majority of the building and then a small projection with the 10 would be appropriate um, for this type of structure and would preserve uh, enough space for the parking lot and then uh, that landscaped area that we're, that we're really, um, really trying to, to dig for there to be able to do uh, some substantial heading, uh, hedging on the rear of the property. Uh, but here's a, here's a photograph of that area with uh, uh, the 10-foot setbacks in those houses uh, on down Rome. Oh, I might add that on the corner, our corner setback, um, although we're actually allowed, it's a seven foot um, setback currently on the corner, we are pushing back and proposing uh, to put our mass more at 15 uh, that is a bit more sensitive to the houses on down Bristol with a projection, giving ourselves a projection down to seven, uh, seven feet, I think it's listed in uh, the PD. And uh, when you go around the, uh, the district, you do see a lot of, of both cot houses that are at the seven or sunrooms and other projections that are two, five or seven feet. So we felt like it would be a, a natural thing to do. Could you, just real quickly, just to make sure a couple things are matching, could you show your the, sort of the schematic elevations so we could look at those and then we'll go back to the site plan real quick? versions of those same same drawings but just um, at a greater scale um, that's uh, facing Rome is there any one in particular or want me to go through them not particular because okay. we're not necessarily looking at that my question more implies to you mentioned um, the inspiration for this is a, a prairie style house and you know because of the transitional qualities and in this image, you, you get those, or you get some of those typical prairie style, you know, attributes and, and kind of characteristics. The thing that I'm questioning is, is you have a pretty decent overhang on these elevations, yes. which are characteristic for prairie style. But on the site plan, those don't read the same. It looks like it's almost those overhangs for that is only a maybe a foot or less, and then in some areas it doesn't show overhangs. So my question is, does that change anything regarding some of your setbacks is as you start to build your building and then expand with your overhangs, is that going to adjust anything on the site plan? Um, uh, good question. The dashed line that's, that's there, um, there, is a, there is a note at the top of the page that says 12-inch um, building base projection because we were wanting to get into the PD, the fact that uh, it may or may not last when we, or, 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 or exist in the final design we present to you, but we wanted to have the ability to do maybe a tapered base like some of the prairie architecture. So that 12-inch that indication, that dash line is for that purpose. Okay. Um, yes. And then, so with that overhang, how, since we don't have that information now, but I would assume it's a, is it two, three feet overhang? Yes, it, it's a three and a half feet. Okay. Yes. So some of these areas where, you know, it's a seven foot setback from sort of the property line on the north, that eave or the gutters portion is going to go up to four feet away from, okay. Yes. Was there any design or any sort of you know, thoughts given to, I understand the, the notion and I appreciate the notion that this is more of a residential height and kind of massing and scale of the building, 
was there any other exercises done to look at either a different configuration, um, either a different massing to where it would allow for, you know, maybe a, a taller building, but then it would allow for some of those waivers that you were requesting um, either not to be needed or a reduction in say maybe you get more parking, those items? I, in terms of uh, going to say a three-story building? For example, like yes. That, for example. Um, you know, we, we um, were, you know, very, uh, I guess we were focused on, on keeping the 35 foot height limit and, uh, and working within that, within that and really feeling like, you know, uh, trying to do a, a residential scaled structure. So we did not go down that road thinking that that maybe would be a much more difficult task. The other, uh, the other situation is with it being a commercial building and requiring two exits and an elevator, we felt like that would build additional complexity in the building. Um, uh, we would uh, most likely have three stairs in that case. If we had a smaller uh, third story, let's just say, um, and some of the efficiencies of the building uh, get tougher when we do that. What is the height of the townhomes that are directly north of this? That's a good question. I don't know. I am just assuming that they met the 35 feet. Okay. Yes. Any additional questions for either staff or the applicant? None, sir. Thank you. None. No. Well, the applicant is allowed five minutes for any rebuttal for the rezoning portion. I would just, Truett Gardner, 400 North Ashley Drive, I just close with, I think Mary Lou said it all. And uh, we appreciate working with her. We were, John, as I said at the onset, did a fantastic job of going to all the, when, when he spoke to me and he said, what should I do? I said, start with the people that you're adjacent to that are most affected and let's work out from there. And that's exactly what he did. And then Mary Lou did a wonderful job of getting a coalition of what all the concerns were and ask us to attempt to handle those concerns through conditions on the site plan, which we've addressed. And so as Stephen said at the beginning, PDs aren't to be taken lightly. They're where flexibility is needed. Uh, we needed the flexibility here for this use and it also provides that great opportunity to provide these conditions which is what we've done and uh, so we thank you for your consideration and look forward to hopefully moving this project forward. Thank you. All right at this point we will close the public hearing the commissioners will now begin discussing the case. Um, anyone like to begin? I personally think this is a relative, for its location, a relatively uh, appropriate uh, project, uh, perhaps more so with respect to Hyde Park uh, as an environment as opposed to some of the other more commercialized properties that we've seen in the past. I like it from the sense of a city planning aspect that it actually provides that plug to Hyde Park Village, mm -hmm. um, that it's actually going to have an end piece now. Um, mm -hmm. I do have some concerns, though, in terms of the, the mass that's sort of represented in the site plan. Um, I appreciate the uh, setback study that was done. I think you're moving in the right direction. I have concerns with the uh, proposed eave encroachment. Um, you know, once that was pointed out, that's a lot of encroachment, and you know that that sense of buffering to the edge. Um, even though I like the intimacy and I understand the intimacy of a historic district, um, we just need to be a little bit, especially when you're getting closer to that north boundary edge and not really understanding how it relates to those, those buildings to just to the north. So there's a little discomfort there in terms of that encroachment on that north property. Other than that, I, I think the um, reduction of the buffer at the alley is, is appropriate. It's, mm -hmm. it's got a, a substantial amount of land.
landscape buffering that's being proposed in my mind. Um, so. And then in terms of the solid waste, we had that discussion. I too am a little concerned about how many um, units will, uh, will eventually be there. Um, there seems to be a lot of capacity in the proposed square footage. So um, understanding that Hyde Park does use smaller uh, trash bins for their um, collection, um, but just ensuring that there's enough space on site to mitigate any concerns about bins being left in the alley and becoming nuisances for others. I don't have anything else than that. I would reiterate the, you know, I think the, the waiver number two and the waiver three for the buffers, I think, you know, there was a, a clear kind of description of why that could be um, and why that, you know, we could accept those based on some of the neighboring properties. So for those, um, not too much of an issue. Similar to the amount of waste that could be possibly produced for solid waste and then how that kind of ties back into the um, amount of garbage cans or recycling cans. There's also, you know, at a, as a 6,000 square foot building, you know, there might be concern over down the road, what does that tie into with the parking, the amount of parking spaces that are in Hyde Park as a whole right now are, is relatively low um, and can get pretty tight. So if there's any additional parking in the future that wouldn't be needed, there's really nowhere to put it. Um, although 16 spaces does seem like a you know a, a good kind of median point vote between that. Um, as a general note, one thing that I would like maybe staff to to look at in the future is the discrepancies between maybe what was presented with the site plan, sort of the schematic piece, and then the site plan that was actually going to be used for zoning. Um, I understand the, the need for the color and kind of that, and it, that does make it a lot easier to understand and read, so I do appreciate that. But there were some key pieces on there that are just drastically different. One site plan showing two ADA parking spots, one showing as one. So some things that would just be nice to be cleaned up so that way it's cohesive, so that way as we're looking at it, we fully understand what we're reviewing and what we're approving um, would be nice. Um, I also have a, a bit of a concern about the kind of the overhangs for the eats. Um, I do like the overall scale and massing of the building, and it looks like it fits well with the building and some of those like, 3D images that we saw does look good, but without fully kind of knowing um, what those eaves will do, it's kind of a hard thing to say. Um, but overall, I do want to say, I, I think the direction that this is going is, is really good. I think it is a nice piece to kind of cap off um, Hyde Park, as one of the, my fellow commissioners has said. So kind of that transition from residential onto the larger piece, I think it is going in the right direction. Um, in terms of conditions, if we are, if you know, rec recommending or not, um, I know I've heard kind of the um, retaining the existing site wall and then also kind of the a final solution for solid waste. Was there any other items that we'd like to discuss? Yeah. Was there any changes um, that we might see or would want to look at and kind of recommend to the site plan? I have, I have a general question for ourselves to, to think about. Um, there, with respect to the uh, motor court, there's going to be a substantial wall fence that's going to be around this. Um, and uh, we have seen some very, very preliminary uh, perspectives indicating this wall being more of a, of a monolithic uh, slab type element. Um, obviously, such a prominent element uh, for this site should dovetail in some respect uh, to the existing, uh, to the new building, but that's neither here or there. But if the question is, if the site plan is approved with just a wall, can we make discussion later when this comes back to us for a certificate of appropriateness as to what, 
behind the wall. Yes. Kind of a, yes. So we yes. can, yeah. So yes. we can yeah. look at the materials um, of what that wall is, mm -hmm. the location, and the height of that will be dictated on the PD and zoning. So we won't be able to say you can make this wall X amount, you no. know, tall, or where it's located. But we will be able to look at what that actual makeup and materials yes, of that because wall is. PD will just cast in stone that there will be a wall here, right. a fence element in this location. Correct. Right. Yes. Thank you. Okay. Just want to make sure we didn't need to add that either. So right now we have what two conditions that we know we want the retaining wall and the the affirming of the solid waste. Mm. Is the third one? Um, do you want to talk about those overhangs? Yeah, I guess the question is if we do we feel comfortable with the building massing as it sits now with the overhangs possibly going extending beyond that. So for me, I feel the north north end of the building and that property line with the three and a half foot potential eave encroachment could be a little tight and we won't have the opportunity to come back and say when they show us where they've gotten to by the CA oh wow that's really tight um, you know do we do we want to pull that back I, mean, I almost feel like more in alignment with the edge of the paving in the site plan, they, they show the little turnaround sort of condition in the edge of the parking. If it fit in there somehow, it seems to allow more bidding in between that north edge if the eaves do, in fact, go that far out. Could could you put up, or could we have maybe this the site plan shown if it's still there? Thank you. I mean, it, only, it only seems like maybe two more feet or so, but it just feels like it needs that comfort, not knowing what those condo buildings really are doing on the other side of that line. Um, I'd hate to get into that in the CA process and we're stuck with something that just doesn't feel right when you look at it from the street and start to think about the neighbors. So then do we want to, for this recommendation, do you want to dictate where that setback is for the eaves? No, I think, I think it's more about the, the building line itself um, because the eaves obviously are going to move with that, right? Well, you, I mean, you could, in theory, still place a building there and only have a, a foot eave overhang on this side. That's true. I mean, I guess it's a question of, yeah, I guess it is the eaves. Overhang on the north, potentially making that a condition. Right. You could say something about just the final point of the building is not to exceed that seven. Well, I, would, I would. I would definitely put it into eaves, and eave encroachment into the setback would not be more than more than the seven feet from the property line. Right. Because I think right. you could, in theory, you, you could. I'm sure there's a way to make design the building to where that even overhang is less on one side and maybe not but I think if we make sure that we state that that's kind of the limit then it allows fluctuation with the building mass <coughs> maybe but I don't know if we do we also need to dictate then the building mass location if we're going to say the E I may make a suggestion um, in that the uh, footprint of the building is what's delineated on the site plan. Uh, in the past, uh, some of the uh, review board's uh, motions have included some type of language which allows them to perhaps increase the setback of the no north um, side yard by up to a certain percent or in a certain uh, amount, like a degree of a foot or two feet, uh, to be determined through the architecture review process. So if you, if you formulate a, a recommendation to city council that that note be added to the site plan, it'll give you some flexibility where the uh, north wall would be situated, and then that would obviously affect where the E would be situated. I think it's, it's a little bit more tricky when you start to, to talk about the eave, because the eaves are not delineated on the site plan. Okay. So in that case, yeah, I would say then we could 
allow the setback to be fluctuated the one or two feet as Dennis mentioned in our condition. Meaning that during the ARC or the yes. review, a certificate of appropriateness approval process, review process, that that would be something that could be variable. Yes. Okay. Any concerns or comments about that, Commissioner Sutton? Uh, personally, I have no issue at all with the uh, eaves as they're preliminarily proposed on the site, ele on the building elevations or their potential encroachment. I think it's uh, part and parcel of uh, the style uh, that they are approaching with this, requiring a very, very strong horizontal. Uh, being in an area that is um, somewhat more commercialized as opposed to uh, being wholly or limited to residential work, uh, we expect our commercial buildings to be tighter to one another. Uh, and uh, I, in that respect, I don't have a problem with that. Well, and I guess my issue becomes the fact that typically, yes, you can have your a business operation or a, a facility or building closer together, but that typically then requires additional life safety requirements in terms of fire mm -hmm. rating and what that rating of those walls become. Without knowing how far and how close the existing structures are or what it could become in the future, if you start placing that building too close or too far to the north, what impact does that have in terms of if, the, if let's say it's 10 feet off or the, the condos are 10 feet off of that property line you're now building is... Well, that, that's the other thing. It's, it's the use right. between the two properties is different. And typically that would be something that you'd have to consider anyway. Yeah. So... <laughs> it's basically just how, what language to use to put a condition in so that it comes back to us in the next CA or? I think if we put some mark mm -hmm. that that north edge of the building mass within mm -hmm. two to three feet as indicated on the site plan to be reviewed during the architectural, the certificate of appropriateness mm -hmm. process. Mm -hmm. I would agree because I think what that would yeah. do is that allows the applicant and the owner to, to leave it as is if they can then prove right. during that application that it, it can uh, that it <laughs> can remain in its location and why um, but then it also gives us the ability to where if that's not met or if it doesn't work then we can we can change it I agree I, I think that's appropriate yeah. okay um, I do want to make sure just to make sure everyone is aware um, the commissioner that makes the recommendation for city council since this goes to city council and is read verbatim um, and cannot staff cannot give any sort of additional context that we need to make sure that it is specific yep specific and clear on what we're saying um, just to make sure it everything kind of <coughs> reads so would a commissioner yeah, like do. to make a motion okay I move to recommend City Council approve ARC 20-401 for the property located at 815 South Rome Avenue. Excuse me, Madam Commissioner, can you please also put REZ 20-8, include that in your, in oh, your motion? Oh, yes, yes, I'm sorry. Okay. I'm sorry. That's okay. I move to recommend City Council approve ARC 20-401, um, REZ 20-80 for the property located at 815, what did I just say, South Rome Avenue um, for the proposed rezoning from RS50 to PD with the following conditions. That the final solution of the historic retaining wall, wall be reviewed during the CA process with the ARC, that um, a final solution for the solid waste location and buffering be provided to staff, and that the um, north setback, um, north setback, 
should also be um, finalized and reviewed during the CA process of the ARC. For two to three feet. I'm sorry, for two to three feet. Is there a, okay. Is there a second? Oh, I'm sorry. I, didn't, I second the motion. And then before we vote, do, does the applicant and or agent um, understand the conditions? And then just for the public record, we'll go on and, and state that. Sure, Gardner 400 North National Drive. Yes, we understand the conditions. And yes, we are fine with this also being included with your recommendation. Thank you. Um, since I have a second, I will all second that. I already seconded. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'll all right. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? All right. Motion passes. Thank you. Commissioners, uh, Ron Vila, staff with Historic Preservation. The last uh, item this evening is ARC 20 448. This is for the address of 1917 West Deco Avenue. This is also in the Hyde Park Historic District. The primary structure is a contributing structure. The zoning classification is RM24. The request is a second story addition to the accessory structure. Currently, the uh, existing accessory structure is one story that has approximately 425 square feet. The second story addition is going to uh, come in at 324 square feet for a total of 749. For the RM zoning classification, you could have up to 750 square feet. So they're under the allotment. This is uh, the Sanborn map. Property is highlighted in the shaded green. The primary structure faces Deco. The accessory structure is uh, a non-contributing structure, but it sits in approximately the same location that the historic structure sat at. Here's an overhead shot. Once again, it's on the corner of Deco and Gumby. As you look down, you see the primary structure and the detached uh, accessory structure. Just to get familiar with the primary structure, this is the front elevation. This came in front of the board to do a, a complete uh, renovation. The, the structure is very compromised and they did an addition to the rear. The addition took place where the jog was at. You see the accessory structure in the background over here. And the request is to add the second story. Just to focus on the accessory structure. You have double doors uh, coming off the secondary street. You have some fenestration uh, to the backyard that's internal. And then the last shot that I have is looking at the structure as it straddles the property line and they just have lap siding on that side, no fenestration. At this time, I'll have the agent, Ms. Shoecraft, address the board. Good evening, commissioners. My name is um, Mary Shoecraft. I'm with <clears throat> Offshore Design Build, and we are the agents for this particular project. Um, as Ron mentioned, um, this is on the corner of Gunby and Deco. And as you can see from this site plan, this is the original house, and the not these owners, the previous owner got permission from the board a couple years ago to do a, an addition on the back of the house. <clears throat> Currently, as um, was mentioned by the staff, there is a small non-contributing structure that was built probably in the last 10 or 15 years. On the north property line, it does straddle the, the um, property line. It sits right on it. And <clears throat> the west uh, side of the um, structure 
also encroaches in what should be a seven foot setback. So what we, we met with um, the historic preservation staff and we also met with the zoning staff to make sure that we could put a second story on this structure because it's non-contributing. And as they said, it was okay as long as we met the setbacks for the second story, knowing that the first story was basically grandfathered because it was there. And we did in fact come in just under the 750 square feet <clears throat> that we have to um, have to have an accessory structure in the RM24 zone, which it's interesting uh, that there is some RM24 scattered around this portion of the neighborhood. I don't really understand it. It could possibly be spot, I mean, I, I just don't know. That's not my, my job to understand that at this point. The other part of the request is to have a pool in the other corner again. As a reminder, the owners of this property are just very recent. They uh, bought this property a month ago. And um, <clears throat> we're not gonna put any pool decking in. It's all gonna be turf. So that's the site plan. This is the floor plans. This is the existing footprint. Um, and in order to park a vehicle that, I mean, that we can get a, a proper vehicle in there, we're asking to add on to, on the first floor, a small area on the back. This is an internal addition, so no changes to these um, sides. And then again, to put the small guest apartment studio on the second floor. Access by an external stair, it has a three fixture bathroom and a bar. This is the existing condition. <clears throat> and these are the north, um, uh, west, south, and east elevations. And this is what we would like to propose, which is the garage door that faces the um, side. This is the back side of the stair, which has lattice. This is the second story that meets all the zoning requirements. Um, and then we have this elevation, <clears throat> which is the east elevation, which is an internal elevation. Again, the stair going up, two windows overlooking the pool. And this being the property line, we're not doing anything on that, obviously. This is the south elevation, which faces internally as well. There's a pedestrian door, two windows overlooking, and again, the stair going up. And then lastly, we've got the um, north elevation. This is what would share with the adjacent property owner, and these windows are high transom windows to give the adjacent property owner um, their privacy. The <clears throat> main house is actually pretty plain. Rumor has it that it was the first house in the neighborhood of Hyde Park to have air conditioning, but I don't know that for sure. It's old, it's built in 1912. It actually has, as Ron showed in the pictures, not a lot of detail for a house in Hyde Park. And, but we would like to pick up that vocabulary. So for example, the brackets on um, the gables, the gable ridge and on the ends would be the um, same size as the ones on the house. The trim detail <clears throat> around the existing residence is just a very plain, there's absolutely no detail to it whatsoever. Um, and it's uh, the beveled lap siding, which I will show you in the um, section, which is here. So currently, obviously, this is the original slab on grade in the garage, and we're going to have to reinforce the first floor to support the second floor. There's the lap beveled um, wood siding to match the house. There's the quarter inch painted wood trim around the windows again to match the house. We have double hung wood windows <clears throat> to match the main house in terms of size. Then there's the painted wood gable and brackets, which are really four by fours, a uh, very simple uh, bracket. Then we have the um, two by six barge rafter and behind it we have the um, bead board. <coughs> on the soffit, and again, that would match the house. <clears throat> this is your typical Hyde Park trim. We would not propose this for the windows, but we wouldn't possibly propose this for the door. There's two pedestrian doors. Uh, as we've presented many times before, this is the wood gel wooden window that we've used 
um, many times in the historic district. Even though this is new construction, we would like to keep wood so it matches the profile of the house. And the windows on the house right now are all one-on-one. -on -one. There's no detail on them. And these are just photographs of the garage as it sits now. Again, it's a pretty, pretty simple structure. That's the view from the street, but also from the back of the house. This being the view from, the, uh, from Gunby. And then again, this just showing the proximity to the neighbor and then the fact that we're pulling it back to meet the zoning requirements for an accessory structure. We would like to consider using <clears throat> a gelled wind door for both the pedestrian doors, the first and second floor door, which is this one here in the craftsman style. For lighting, we would like to propose gooseneck lighting. There is no um, decorative lighting on the house at all. So we're hoping that this might be carried over onto the main house. <clears throat> For the garage doors, um, we've used the Coachman collection quite a few times in Hyde Park with the colonial lift handles. And um, this particular design on the, um, on the garage door, which will be a double door. And that concludes my presentation for tonight. Ron Vila with Historic Preservation. Staff's finding that this application is consistent with the Hyde Park design guidelines. A couple conditions um, that were addressed on the staff report. Uh, to go up higher than 15 foot in height, a, form, a design exception is required. It's an administrative function. I believe that she started the process. If she could elaborate on where that's at. Since the garage is so close to the sidewalk, the single door seems out of scale. Uh, sometimes when they're towards the rear, you could get away with it. It's kind of hidden behind uh, the primary structure. But uh, two doors would be more appropriate with the scale to break down some of the massing there because of the location of the structure. To provide uh, some reference for the uh, air condition, the, the mechanicals and the pool equipment uh, to locate that on the site plan. And if there's any fencing that is going to be um, installed as part of this, they do have a perimeter fence now and with the new construction, uh, that fence would probably have to come out and if they plan on having some privacy and meeting the uh, city of Tampa code for having a pool as well. They have to have some kind of perimeter fence there as well. So if she could address those items, um, I'll be here to answer any questions. Thank you. At this point, we'll open the hearing for any public comment. Seeing and hearing no one, um, the commissioners will now begin asking questions for the project. Anyone? I guess first thing would just be to address um, Ron's things. Uh, first, we have applied for a design exception to allow a structure that's 22 feet tall in the historic district. Um, and that, that the, the application and all the um, documents have been filed with zoning with uh, Joel Sousa. Uh, we expect to have a response within the standard. I think it's 10 or 15 business days, but we're well into that right now. Um, the question about the garage door um, we were hoping that the double colonial doors would suffice from an aesthetic point, but if we need to do two separate doors, we can. We do have the room for that. Um, sorry, what was the third item? Um, just the location of the AC oh, and also the pool equipment. So the pool equipment is going to go, and I'll show you on the site plan, on the far side of the house. Sorry, wrong way. Over here is where the equipment, the pool equipment is going to go on this side, which okay. is the internal side, mm -hmm. and meet the zoning requirements. The AC unit is going to go underneath the stair, and that's going to be covered by lattice. Okay. And the fencing? The, the fencing is existing now, and um, we would propose to continue it so it would terminate at this corner with a gate. Okay. The same fencing? Yes. Uh -huh. Okay. It's a, just a, a board on board fence. Just a point of, uh, of perhaps a drafting error. Are you missing a door onto your second level that. from your stairs? Yes. 
Can we uh, take a look at that elevation, please? Sure, absolutely. I can tell you it was there once. <laughs> You pay for it's a magic to draw marker. <laughs> Let's take a look at the uh, head of the stairs. How deep are those overhangs? They are um, two feet. They're two feet. Mm -hmm. Okay, so they match the house. I was, I was wondering how exact it's, the scale of this is, is bouncing back and forth between a, you know, a small building and a big building. I was just concerned about having sufficient cover over that second floor door uh, for you know, weather protection. Uh, very often, you know, when, these, when we get involved with some of these uh, smaller buildings like this, the eaves are so shallow to the building that you don't have any weather protection. The next thing you know, you're, you know, you've got a dying door on your hands. Um, in fact, I'm going to do that myself right now. <laughs> uh, so it, it's not an unusual consideration. Also, uh, I understand the point of putting your mechanical equipment for this facility underneath your stair when you're screening this with guys. Um, how are you planning on making access to this? Are you actually going to be making a lattice door? Yes. Mm -hmm, we do. The, the lattice is custom made and, and then we make a, a custom door. Can you also show on the west elevation where the intended fence is dying? It would, it would die right here. I can't, uh, I can't see you. I'm table. sorry. No, uh, it doesn't. Oh. Can you go to the one on the table? Yes, yes I can. <laughs> sorry. So it would die past the, the trellis that's under the stair. Yeah, that would be behind the fence. Correct. Um, so it would be here. This would be our corner. You know, I don't have an issue at all uh, with the, uh, uh, the garage door as, as proposed. Could we see the garage door again? Can you show us a picture? Yes. <clears throat> okay. It would be two of these. Can you, can you put that next to the elevation that you have drawn? Don't mm -hmm. you have, you have lights above it, right? Yes, we. Are they lights or are they just panels? Um, we haven't decided yet. The door, the pedestrian door that we have will have lights on it. Some people don't want to have lights on their garage doors, especially when they're so exposed. Yeah. So we haven't really determined that. Okay. Because the, the two don't seem to match up with the cut sheet. There's also design number 11, which probably would be more appropriate. And then this particular product line, you can drop in glass that is divided in those two rectangles or not, depending on what the client would prefer from a safety and security standpoint. Right. So we can assume right now that, that whatever's happening with these garage doors in terms of what they're gonna find would be like is still up in the air at this point. In time. So a, a little bit, yeah. Perhaps a point of coordination with staff. That's typically where it gets done. I have no further question. There is a, a remark here in the staff about the window proportions on the west elevation. Has that been satisfied to staff's concern or is there still some concern? There's still some reservations. I was looking for more traditional windows with the, uh, the size of the windows, mm -hmm. single windows that match the paired windows on the south and on the east. Uh, I don't know how that uh, plays with the floor plan, though. That, that is the difficulty. It could be done with for one but not the other, unless we did a dummy bottom sash, which we have done before. I mean, if it has to happen, it can, but it just seems like from a historic standpoint, I don't particularly think that this is something that does not um, conform to the guidelines. But if we needed to do a, a double 
one over one, we can, but the one on the left is in the shower. So the bottom would be a dummy. Understood. is in regard to how the siding is going to finish when it gets to grade. So you had shown the, the wall section. Can we go back to that? And can you walk us through that again, how the siding is going to end before the grade? So the siding is usually pulled up from the um, existing concrete slab, as shown here, in this section right here. Right. It usually sits about six inches above just on the elevations, it looks like it goes straight to grade. So I just wanted to be sure about that. Thank you. Anything else? That's it for me. I have a question for staff. So the CA for tonight was for a, an accessory structure, basically in addition to it, but it's also, we're being presented with a, a pool and site mm -hmm. changes. There was some discussion about the pool being uh, introduced this evening, and then there was other discussions that the pool was omitted. Staff has the ability to administratively approve pools, so it wasn't indicated on the plan. I think we were kind of doing some site planning to see where everything was going to go. So tonight, I would just stay with the accessory structure, and then I would take care of the pool at the staff level. Okay. So don't even mention it in mm -hmm. the... Okay. Correct. Could we look at your site plan for, for a minute? So, I have a question about the roof overhang. So it looks like what's happening is, and this might be because of the existing, but on the, the I guess the west side mm -hmm. facade where the garage doors will be up along the road, you have a bit of the overhang for the roof that goes, kind of projects in front of the stairs. Mm -hmm. And then can we look at the existing elevations? So that doesn't exist now, correct? That is correct. So we would be adding that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And let's look at the um, new elevations. So what was the thought process of adding that roof overhang on the, the right side of the west facade? Um, it was basically to balance this elevation from here to here, understanding that there's going to be a fence that goes all the way in. You're not going to see it. I mean, you're not going to see the lat most of the lattice behind it. So that was the thought behind it. So how does that, from a, if we were to kind of turn, it looks like on the south facade. Here. Okay, that, that's, is that how it's going to end yeah. in the condition? Correct. So what is it going to, I guess, die <coughs> into for the, the stairs or lattice? Is maybe my question. It's, it is, it is, so, oh, sorry. It's at this point here that it's going to turn and die into the lattice, that's correct. And then there would have to be a cricket there in order to get the water, do, do you see what I'm saying, off yes. that to go, to go into, so it doesn't go into the lattice. Okay. So, second question is, you're adding a shower. Outdoor on, shower. Outdoor mm -hmm. shower on the north end. So your east elevation, maybe it's showing, I don't know. Is the roof that goes all the way over that? Correct. Correct. Mm -hmm. And it's screened from the interior, but not from the property to the north? Screened from the, there's a fence. But the that, fence is to the, the. There's a fence, I'm sorry. There's a fence, right? There's going to be a fence. There is a fence there now. Okay. It will stay. So it's not going to be open to the property owner, All right. to, the, to the west. So structurally, what is your plans to actually 
because if we're looking at the um, kind of the overall floor plan, if you want to real quick, what is the strategy we're going to you're going to take and the, the builder is going to take to actually allow for that setback on both the kind of the north and the um, west facades to allow that second story? How are we going to build it? Yes. How does that relate to the design guidelines? Uh, well, I'm having a question in terms of... We're going to rebuild the first floor. It's going to be completely rebuilt in order to support the second floor. The roof on the original structure has to come off, mm -hmm. right? And so then we're going to have to put beams basically inside in order and, and load them on the, on the outside walls in order to support the second story, because remember, the second story has to come in. Right. The only place the second story sits on the first story wall <coughs> is on the east elevation and on the south elevation. So how much north and west it has to it has to come in. So in how much of the meet. existing accessory structure will remain for the exterior? The or first floor walls will remain, but the roof has to go. Okay. So then is the intention will be for all the materials to then match and tie into what's existing there now for like exterior trim siding those things yes uh-huh okay is there and the likelihood is that most of it will be new okay. or quite a lot of it will anything change on the west elevation in terms of dimensions if you go to a two-car garage kind of separate garage doors versus one um, the outside dimensions will not change right so there's going to be a small divide here is what we're going to have to slide in there, which in my opinion is going to feel cramped once we, we're barely going to have any siding. It's almost going to be like the trim on either one of the doors is going to be knocked up against each other. So visually, at least in my opinion, from uh, how does this impact the historic district, I don't agree with the staff. Uh, I'm not saying anything wrong doesn't know uh, because how tight that space is. And then were any other overall designs looked at to accommodate a sort of a overall design piece for this west elevation to where you did not have that roof overhang on the right side to where that need to, you know? Um, yes, quite a few were um, looked at. Okay. Is there a reason why, I guess maybe one of those didn't you didn't go with one of those instead? Um, we thought this was a better alternative. Okay. Can you put up the, um, the actual photo of the existing accessory structure, please, from the street? Sure. Thank you. Next, next to the elevation of the... Of the oh, I'm sorry. Uh, that's okay. Can we zoom out a little bit, please, staff? And well, can she can move, move the it? photo. Yeah, yeah. yeah let me move this over yeah, and then I can try it. to get you a little better. Let's. Can I? Yeah. And then there's the existing Perfect. condition. So okay. that's, Perfect. this is what we were trying to avoid. So on the existing accessory structure at the alley side, is there's still an overhang on that side, correct? Mm hmm. That's existing. And that encroaches into the alley. It actually encroaches into the property on to the, oh, to the north. Oh, it's the property next door. Yeah, there's no alley. The alley was vacated many years ago. And um, in, in the we, proposed, there is no overhang. Was we that were, a condition? We were, we were taking it off at the owner's request, yes. At the owner's request? Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. So in this photo that you have here, the fence seems to be farther back than where it looks like it might be dying into the, the new proposed building? Yes, that's correct. Okay. The new fence will be pulled out a little bit and it's within the fencing setback requirements. Okay. Are there any other additional questions either for the applicant or for staff? Commissioner Sutton? No more question. Thank you. Okay. Um, the applicant is allowed five minutes for a rebuttal. None. All right. 
At this point, we'll close the public hearing and the commissioners will discuss the case. Can we leave that image up, please, staff? Thank you. Yes, just thank you. So the, um, the new roof, to me, seems out of sorts. Um, you know, when you look at the existing primary structure, the historic, even just the historic components, um, it's all gable, and having a hip just seems so foreign. Um, and not only foreign, but then it seems like it's doing you a lot almost of took like the mass, and then you slid everything over. Right. So it's, it's a like foreign. A cake that got frosted incorrectly. Yeah. So you have a foreign piece in the first place, and then it's not the way it would typically be seen second. Yeah. And I'm, I'm having a hard time as you move around, as you move around to the alley slash property, you know, adjacent property side, understanding how it's actually working form wise. Yeah. This is a tough one to figure out in terms of how it's actually going to work. And, and I understand that's not typically a component of what's in the guidelines, but we still have to be concerned with it from a three-dimensional perspective. You know, you're going to be walking and seeing it from various angles. Um, so I, I, I question the roof form. It's resultant. I, I also have a couple concerns with the roof form, as you mentioned, and then the area where it doesn't look like there's any overhang at all, how does that kind of tie into the wall from a construction standpoint, but then also just a historical standpoint, what does that look like and how does that kind I, of- I agree, I mean, I can understand why the owner might not want it there. Um, <coughs> it, it just does not, it's, it's not historically correct. It's, it's an <coughs> odd condition. I won't even go into the architectural concerns, but um, and um, in regards to the garage doors, I agree. I think those need to be two individual doors. I think there's enough precedence throughout the district and other districts that show how to do that historically without worrying about little pieces of trim, um, you know, siding. I I really feel like you need to keep to the two-door strategy to be uh, consistent with the, the historic district. So. And in terms of the windows, I, I really don't, on the west elevation, I don't see those as being problematic. I understand the function and the use, They're, uh, especially with the uh, one that's in the shower bathing space. Um, you know, you'll see that in historic structures, as, primary structures as well, where bathrooms and kitchens are, the windows are different, um, they're often smaller, they're not necessarily always double hung, so I'm, I'm, you know, I'm not as concerned about the windows. Commissioner Sutton or Commissioner Jacobus? I don't really have anything to add. I do agree that the roof looks a little odd for the historic district, uh, the first floor roof. Um, I agree. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot of pushing and shoving going on here to be able to put on the second floor addition. It is turning uh, a very basic uh, accessory structure, the two in the one story garage, into something that's very, very disconcerting and quirky. Uh, elements that are just not resolved. For instance, uh, the hip roof. I, because of things sliding past one another and, and the resolution of meeting up these edges and the open spaces, I can see the hip roof as being bit part and parcel of this. That, you know, the extended overhang on one side, the zero <laughs> overhang on the other side. How does it actually wrap around the entire building? How does it terminate? Just adds to that quirkiness that that makes this so un <laughs> feeling so unfinished. Uh, the the main building that this is uh, that occupies this site, uh, even with its uh, uh, large scale addition, 
and its two-story mass overall uh, seems well portioned uh, and well finished. Something's missing here, and I can't put my finger on it. Okay. okay. Would a commissioner like to make a motion um, for the project? I, may I say something, or I'm not allowed to say anything at this point? The Kamari Pettis Mappa from the city attorney's office, the hearing would have to be reopened in order for you to make a comment. Would a commissioner like to reopen the case or? I no. move that we reopen for comment from the applicant. I second the motion. All in favor? Aye. 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 Against? Motion passes. Um, we would like to continue to work on this and come back next month if that would be agreeable to the commission. So we would like to request a continuance. Sure. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Um, at this point, we'll close the public hearing. Um, the commissioners can now discuss the case or make a motion. I would like to make a motion unless there's some discussion points. And then oh, we have done it. <laughs> if, you're, if you are going to consider a continuation, it would be December the 9th. The 9th. would be the date. I move to grant a continuance in case ARC 20-448 for the property located at sorry, 1917 West Deacle Avenue um, to the December 9th public hearing at 6 p.m. I second that motion. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Against? Motion passes. Thank you. Thank you. Meeting is adjourned.